I'd like to say this is a man who needs no introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. Yes, I do. Yeah, he does. If my name was Quincy Jones, uh, then you would need to do it. <laughs> Fortunately, it's not. Quincy Jones. No. Uh, this is Jack Joseph Puig, a man whom you know by name and reputation. Um, I like to pull one thing out of his bio every year to feature, and this year it's the fact that you are the man who does all of the crows. You do the black crows, you do the counting crows, and you do the Cheryl crows. All the crows. Which is very impressive. Um, last year, Jack did a feature on a, a compression for us, and I learned more in 45 minutes from Jack on compression than I've learned in 30 years on my own trying to bang into the walls. Today, he's here to talk about how to get the most out of your vocals. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jack Joseph Puig. Hi, so uh, I thought what we're going to do here is I'm going to just uh, go through this session. You know, one of the things that's interesting about vocals, I, I um, constantly get um, complimented on mixes that I do about the vocals. And for, for a very long time, I used to always be uh, personally very, like, disappointed, kind of. Like, well, how come you're not talking about the beat or talking about this or talking about that or, you know, things that maybe I felt that I had really contributed uh, to a particular mix or an artist or something that I was proud of and that I felt really good about. And then one day I just kind of woke up and realized, you know, the most important thing really is the voice. It's the loudest thing in the mix. It's uh, what conveys the emotion, the feeling, the storyline, everything you can imagine. It's really 100% about the voice. Uh, so I let go of that. But that being said, um, Another thing to consider about when you're working with voices, right, is that how it actually relates you know, to the track. Now, the one thing that's always difficult about these kind of situations, so let me just say this right from the get-go. By the way, can everyone see the screen? Okay. Uh, from the get-go is that obviously we have people here that have uh, got platinum wall records on their walls and didn't start yesterday. And then we have people here that don't know the difference between a microphone cord and an extension cord. So please be patient with some things I might say that are so elementary, but for those who don't have that experience, it's, it's kind of unfair to skip that step. So <clears throat> let me just play a little bit of this track. I think what's happened here is that when the HDMI plug went in, it changed my ability to change the level on the laptop itself. So if you could give us a lot more of this computer and a lot less of the ambience in the room. What is so ambient in the room? It can't be just my lab. It can't be just this. It's just this microphone? Really? It's going to be very difficult for them to really have a full experience with this. Um, okay. Uh, let me ask you this. Can you do two things? Um, first of all, just take out a lot of low end. Just EQ, EQ go to the, wherever you got in the low end, just roll it off. A bunch of it. And roll up high, high highs. Like anything from 7K and up. Just okay, let's see if you can get me more like in the 3K, 2K range. So they can hear me clear and we can pull it down a little bit so they can hear because we're going to be talking about detail and I don't know how the hell they're going to do it. That's getting better. Okay, and then even pull me down a little bit. I'll speak a little bit loud. I'll talk loud into, uh, into the microphone. Can you go down a little farther, a little farther yet? Testing one, two, three, four. Just rate lower my voice a bit, please, if you would mind. Lower, testing one, two, three, lower, lower. Lower if you can, lower, 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 lower. Keep going down lower, because what I'll do is I'll just stop, I'll stop this if it's, I, I won't, there, that might get a little bit better. Is that better, guys? You can hear a little bit better, right? Can you go a little farther? Me too, worlds, excuse me, guys and girls. Down, down, a little farther, a little farther. Yet my voice won't come down any farther. Or are you guys worried about, are you recording or something? Or, hello, hello.
Okay, that's better. Okay, that's, that, I think that uh, that's a little bit better, right, for everybody? Okay, now I'm gonna play the track. I'm gonna play the track and let's see uh, what that level's like. It's way too low. The track now. Let's crank it up. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Are you guys hearing the top end distorting? Sounds like we have maybe a headroom issue because uh, all the S's and the hi-hats and things, it's like there's no headroom. Um, fortunately, I don't know this console, so I don't know what I'm looking at. So there's no EQ on the stage. Yeah. yeah, what's happening is that it's going to be very difficult to talk about consonants, you know, and the attack of things because it's just, it's just distorting out. So the headroom isn't right somewhere. Somewhere, um, like um, this fader here, is that driving everything? This is driving everything. Because maybe if you pull all this back and push that up, you'll get 20, what is it, almost 19 dB more headroom, wouldn't you? I mean, I don't want to wreck your vibe. Is it, is that drag to pull that back? Try that and push that up. Let's see what that does. Oh, look, I lost my voice. But... You're the fire when I'm caught up. You're the captain, I'm the soldier. I'm out of go, go, go against the way. Unfortunately, we have a headroom mismatch someplace. Either the output of this device doesn't like the box it's going into. There's no control over there in terms of where I can adjust the uh, input level. If I hit the box and pad it down and pull the volume down and give that less level, it still doesn't like it. It's like it doesn't have any headroom. And if it's not that, it might be just the headphone system itself just has no headroom. 
So that means that this is going to be, um, I'll make it the best I can, but um, sorry about that. I really am. Um, you can't even hear any of the subs in the low end or anything. It's very, so uh, nothing I can do about that. Apologize. So uh, one of the things that worked really well for me, I'm just going to go through some of the things that I've, I do that I like. Um, so this one here, I call this magic because uh, it kind of is magic to me. I want you to see it. Um, so it's an equalizer, it's a reverb. This plugin, which is CLA's 1176. Now, historically speaking, in the recording industry, certain products come along that people make, whether it be like an SM57, for instance, right? You, an SM57 is always going to work. You can take it, just throw it in a room, steer paint with it, record something. It's just like a, an old standby, L1 standby, right? Telefucking 251, U47. 67, 87, there's certain things just, they just work. And I am I know for a fact that in a lot of cases, those manufacturers don't even realize what they made. They can't even duplicate it. They try to duplicate it again, they can't. For whatever reason, just all the things came together right. I think this plug in here, to make a long story short of Chris's, um, I have to say is right. It just is right. Um, this by far, I've told him this, is by far his best plugin. This one just came out of the factory correct. Um, and it's really, really great. It's great for voice, it's great for a lot of things, but I thought I'd just point that out. So let me just exaggerate here for a second with this does. Let's see where it's playing. Big session, this one. All right, where are you? This 
also doesn't like. I'm sorry about that. 81, 82. Not 61, I had the effects master off when I was going to show you something with the drums and the beat only. This has to be on. tough about this is because of our high frequency issue we have here with the system. Um, you, you can hear it distorting, but just try to factor that out. So, <clears throat> this, if, if anyone likes what this sounds like, we should, at the end, put it up to just take a shot with your phone and copy this and copy this because it's, it's a great setting. I've tried duplicating it. Um, I've tried to beat it. Can't beat it. And it really works well. Now, what I like about it is not so much that it's adding a lot of that typical pop high end that you hear on vocals, but my ability to, to go for the, the amount of attack I want on the voice to get it to line up with the beat. So like when you're when you're mixing voice you know, vocals, one of the other things is important, right? Is to figure out where you want what you want to be leading the beat. So they're singing a little bit on top of the beat. The farther I push them up, the faster the song feels. The, fast, the farther I bring them back, the slower the song feels, even though I'm not changing the beat, right? So it's not, when you're working on vo vocals, it's not just about the vocal sound or what effects you have, but so much like how it relates to the beat and the record. Again, I'm gonna say this one last time. There are people in here that know nothing and there's people who know a lot, so be patient. So, um, one of the things I try to do when I'm mixing, and I shouldn't say try, I do, is I, I get the voice in really fast. You know, like really, really, really fast. Uh, it, I've had situations where I've spent, when I didn't know what I was doing, you know, I should say maybe less experience, where I would spend all this time getting the record to sound just dumb, sound stupid. You know, hours of this, try this thing, try that, do this, do that, all kinds of stuff. Then put the voice in, and it's like, uh, uh oh, it doesn't work. Usually when it didn't work, it was because I made the track so powerful, the voice couldn't stand up to it. So then that means, oh, okay, well, I better add distortion. I better do this, I better do that. And then you find yourself fighting between wanting to keep this 
track, this beat that you've made that sounds so awesome, right? And of course you gotta have the voice, but now you're in the wrong space because now you're not thinking about well, what is the person saying? What is the song about? And so then in the end, you play for people and they go like, it really sounds awesome, but like no one's kind of tapping their foot and it's kind of like not working and it doesn't become a hit. And you're like, what did I do wrong? You know, it came on the radio, it sounded better than anything that was on either side, but it was dead from the waist under. No pelvic energy, it wasn't sexy, it didn't feel right. You know, I noticed that when I'm mixing, um, you know, everyone does, will tell you today and tomorrow and the next day when you walk around here that they're gonna tell you how the emotion's the most important thing and the feeling's the best thing and the plugins don't matter and equipment doesn't matter and we all know that that's just not right. It's a little bit of both, right? Even if the equipment just makes you feel good, it's worth it. Even if that's all it's for. They give you the courage. I find that, um, that if I don't get the voice in right away, I, I will get this balance and correct, as I just said. But what I really have discovered now through experience that I can impart to you is that when you really, when you really get it right, the best way to measure it, you know, people talk about like, oh, the, the hairs are standing up or I get this feeling. The way you can really tell is when you're working along and all of a sudden you're like, oh, so that's, so that's what they're saying. Like, this person left me because this happened and that happened and my life's been miserable because it's the same thing for 50 years, right? My life is shit, come back to me. Pop, rock, guitars, marshals, beats, NPC, whatever. It's still the same thing. We're all human, we're just communicating social and emotional elements. But I find that when I start really listening and all of a sudden start connecting to the song and like really understanding what they're saying, I got it. Especially when I feel like I discover lyrics as I said a moment ago, or something that I didn't even know what the song was about. I thought it was about X and it was really about Y. And then you got it. And then when you hit that point, you gotta like, whoa, stop a second. I'm like, okay, why is it working? You know, why is it delivering? And make sure that you don't pass it. I've done that. I've done, done that where I've tried to make something have the most coolest sound, or the most attack, or the most power, or the most low end, the most whatever. And again, it has all that, but it doesn't mean anything, right? This thing I just showed you, uh, this thing I'm calling magic. Also, if you have vocals that are a little bit dull, or lackluster, it totally fixes it in a really great way. Some of the basic things never go away. You know, we're always searching for the rainbow, the new cool plugin, the new cool this, the new cool that, whatever it is. And like everything in life, there are some rudimentary basic things that will never, ever steer you wrong. Like the analogy I made about the SM57. You know, you put it in front of the guitar amp, it's probably gonna work. Put it in front of a voice, it's probably gonna work. Put it on snare drum, it's probably gonna work, right? And we can go through all those things. So where I'm going with that statement is like even this kind of thing, which all of you I'm sure have seen a hundred times, right? So just widening the pitch. You're like, okay, well, I came to AAS and the guy showed me like widening the pitch, I already know that. Now, that's true, you already know that, right? But you could also say, well, what could I do with that? I could just put that on because that's what I saw in so-and-so's video on YouTube, or I saw it at wherever, in Sado's place, Mix of the Masters, whatever I saw it, but then, what you need to do is get creative with it. You need to think like, okay, well, maybe if I add something like this and exaggerate the top end, what does that do? You know, what harmonics, if I take a harmonic generator, and this is actually a harmonic machine, and I exaggerate it, what do I get? So there's two things I wanna get, get across there is one, to take rudimentary things and try things that you've just never tried before to them. And, not, and, and understand that using rudimentary things are rudimentary because they work. I'm willing to bet that you've heard records on the radio or someone that you admire that you went and bought their record or whatever. 
and you think the vocal sound is unbelievable. And if you could actually open the session, you'd be like, uh, it's exactly what that guy was talking about at AAS. It was just a pitch thing they had on there. Some compression on the side, like, what the hell? So don't ignore the rudimentary things is the point, right? Something else I'd like to do um, is in these three faders here that are odd colored here. Um, left, dedicated left reverb, mono, dedicated center, and a dedicated right. In a sense, in a sense, we live in this world now where, you know, especially like with a lot of keyboards and things that they say they're stereo, but they're really fat mono, right? Um, there was a record I made um, with a band that I'm sure most of you won't know because it's been a long time ago called Jellyfish. And we were wanting to use a lot of things like Warless Urge and some of the older stuff that, that were used in, in a generation they really admired, the band admired. And so the World Series is just mono. It's, it's basically one output. And what we ended up doing is taking two World Series and tying the sustain pedals together with tape and then pan one left, pan right, so that when you played, you actually had stereo, right? So what is great about that is the way our, we perceive where something is, left, right, up, down, whatever, right, is literally by where something lives in the pan world. If you have a stereo reverb, any of the normal stereo reverbs that we all use, they sound big and lush and they come up, right? But they do nothing for you in terms of saying, well, that's there, that's there, and that's there. Additionally, uh, with mono reverb, let me show you. Yeah. Let me assign it to these right now. So I've got 9, 10, and 11. obviously in the center. So we only have center. We don't have stereo. I'm so sorry, everybody. Um, do you have any idea why we wouldn't have stereo? It's only mono. Oh, son of a bitch. It's only effing mono. Fuck. Sorry. So many things I want to show you, and I'm just like hand tied here. Uh, okay, so you got it. You guys just experiment with the idea um, of left, center, and right. It's really, really uh, fantastic uh, for placing the voice in a perspective that you really want. And I'll tell you another reason why it's kind of important. You know, one of the things that um, is really, really great about old records, right? I, that I think we might all admire. When I say old records, I'm really, in particular, kind of picking the 70s area, roughly, is the three-dimension element. You know, when we got to the 80s, um, compression came so much into our lives, and it, so it became so much about everything being basically in your face. And if everything is loud and nothing is soft, then there's no dimension in terms of Z. There's no depth, because it's all on the same plane. And with the three reverbs, you can create that feeling of 
something being so far over here and something being deeper over here. And you start to get the that point. And especially if you, I was using those Abbey Road Chambers because I had, had them EQ'd really, really bright. And you can really make three points or multiple plates points of where something is. And with a voice, it's really, really great because you can create the, the attitude of the, you, what you want with the voice exactly beautifully perfect because that reverb is married to it and it feels like it belongs together. You know, it doesn't feel disconnected. Um, obviously, sometimes you want to be disconnected, of course, right? But in a case where you want the vocal to, to you know, maybe on a slower song or a mellow song or something, you want to be real emotional and you want to connect with it, you want to feel more intimate, and you want to feel like you're with it. Uh, a mono reverb can be great. Or even if you take those two other ones and pen them in, if you get a combination of the three, they can be really great. So just try that. I can't show you. Um, in fact, there's a lot of things that I was trying to understand why it wasn't translating like it's supposed to. And now I know why it's not translating because everything's collapsing into mono. Um, it's pitch shift. Some of that pitch shift really high, really works great. So, for instance, that right there was going to turn up the lit, what I call LR. That's like a panning that's going back and forth. It creates a really good movement. And if you get it just right, it's moving great with the track and the feeling of it. It's moving back and forth and makes the vocal feel like it's moving. And it draws you in. I can't demonstrate that because we're in mono. So if I just turn it up. It just doesn't do anything, as you just noticed. Um, so. I'm just wondering if we would do best now with maybe just answering some questions because I can't really show you much. Uh, there's no energy. There's no you know. There's no headroom. I can't. I can't show. So we, I guess we should just maybe yep. chat. I saw your hand first, so you get the microphone. Sorry. So okay. So I I wonder if you can talk about all of the different sends that you have going on. Um, and and maybe how, like in what proportion you you're, you're sending your vocal to the each to, to the various um, you know different different uh, sends that you have set up. Maybe what they do. If you could just describe it, even if we can't sure. exactly hear what they're doing. Well, what I can describe is that obviously the thing that's always important. Look, I have mixed feelings about what I'm about ready to say. So again, when you travel around here in the next three days, people are going to show you like this is my template, right? I have mixed feelings about that. I mean, I understand the template because it's fast, it's easy, it's dependable, it's there. It makes you feel a little bit secure. You know that this works, that works. But it doesn't allow you sometimes to, um, you know, explore. I'm gonna tell you something I shouldn't say, all right? I, I, I shouldn't say this, I really should. But I, I like to say certain things because I feel like people, it's good for them to learn about it. So. I'm at a dinner table at Bob Clear Mountain's house. Now, I don't know if people who know who Bob Clear Mountain is, but a lot of us um, think he is one of the absolute best ever. It's Bob Clear Mountain, myself, and a guy named Chris Lavalgin, three of us. And Bob says, somehow we get to the conversation about starting mixes. And Chris is like, yeah, well, you know, I just put up the next song, and you know, whatever it is, I just fucking whack that shit up. And, like, you know, and Bob's like, what, what do you mean? He goes, well, you know, I just like turn up the, well, you mean you don't like to start like, here's this, here's this, and listen to it goes, no, 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 man, I have all that shit already in there. I just like, 
I just like, you know, move the shit around. Or, I remember hits the fucking compressors. That's how it hits that shit, you know? Talk to the fucking Grammys. And Bob and I just look at each other like, well, why, why would you not listen to the song and then like pull up each fader, you know, listen to it, get an understanding of what it is and how you might like want to create it, how you might want to like, what perspective you think it should be, what the song feels about. And, you know, both those two people I just mentioned are very successful. They're entirely different. And, and, and think that each other's wrong, you know, vehemently, right? Because I was in the middle like, yeah, well, it's cool, you know. And was, but they, they would have gotten, you know, kind of like in the fight over it. So all that to say that one uses the template and one kind of doesn't use the template. You know, they have, one has things that he knows he can go to and one is like, it's a template. This comes up, this goes here, this channel goes there, this goes there, that goes there. They both make hit records. Right. So it's important, I guess you can say, I'm, I'll give you both perspectives on the template. So here, you know, there's a template immediately have all the obvious things I said that you should not ignore. So there's the pitch thing I explained, you know, a freeze reverb, you know, that you can hit and just holds that note, whatever it is that you're doing the effect. A distorted quarter note is obvious, you know, a queen thing, which is like a very you know short delay that goes back and forth. Again, we can't hear it in these headphones. Sixth note to nay. These owl delays, uh, I kind of stole, frankly, from 311 when I went to 311. They, 311 had really cool sounding repetitive delays. And I did a mix, um, a few mixes for them. And I just loved their settings. So I stole them and I called them Owl. Because I guess the song we were working on, that particular song was called Owl. So I stole it for them, even though I'm taking full credit. And um, then you have all your, you know, all your obvious things, you know, like a typical quarter note, typical eighth note delay. You want to always have a throw, you know, that's just ready to go, a nice long throw that's ready to go for a certain word, a certain line. All those things are, are, are your typical things, you know, different kind of filtered uh, delays compressed differently, EQ differently, filtered, whatever. You can have all those things set up on the sense. These are all typical. They seem like, well, but they're not fancy, but when you get them all right, like the high octave harmo, harmo I talked about, you get the delays right, you get the mondo thing, which I can't show you, the stereo thing moving right, and you get what that magic fader I'm talking about, all those highs, and you get that right, and you get the compression right. You get the attack of the voice right. It's very clear and easy and intelligible to understand and fits with the kick and the snare and the, the top end of the bass and the hi-hat. Because when you're balancing, you know, people talk about how balancing the most is the most important thing, and it is. But you also want to balance, you want to be able to go down to what I would call the expert page. So let's say the non-expert page is just balancing, right? The mix, whatever, whatever you have, you're balancing it the best you can. The expert page is now going down to the next level and going, okay, now I'm going to balance attacks, right? How, how much transit designer whichever one you used, if that's on a hi-hat, a snare, a kick, a guitar, or whatever it is, or, there are many, many transit designers now, like 30 of them. And you get those attacks where it's really pumping up. Are you about, when you listen at a real low level, are all those attacks hitting exactly together? And are they, the next expert pages, are they the same kind of attack sound? Is one real flubby and one real bright? So does that cause another level of confusion in how the ear perceives where things are sitting in the bar line? Does that make sense? And then, which I can't show because we're distorting here, same thing with the voice. You want the, the attacks, the consonants of the voice to line up in the same way with all those things. So when you play the record, it just moves and it swings and it feels like it's a unit. Does that make sense? Simple, but simplicity is a lot of things I think sometimes we, we miss. And my concern is that with the preset generation, which a lot of you are part of, you're just getting the preset, which are a lot more effing great, right? But not understanding why, how that preset was made and why it was made along the lines like of what I just said. Did I answer your question? So Jack, real quick, um, yeah. how did you deal with the sibilance? You had quite an extreme high-end boost on the voice. How do you deal with sibilance at that point? Uh, well, it depends. Um, I like using the F6 a lot. So let's see if I have an F6 on this session. I probably do. I am um, a real sucker for dynamic EQ. 
So I'm just going to pull one up. I think that this is one of the best ways to actually do it. Where are you? There you are. I think this is one of the best ways to, to do it. And I'm, what I generally do is I will grab, this has not let me down yet. I'll grab the EQ point, right? And I'll sweep it to what, I, what I'm really feeling like, okay, there's that simplest, you know, that seven point, making up something, 7.4K. You know, and then I will go down to the queue here and see how much of it I want to grab out or maybe I want to grab a little bit more. And once I have that option, okay, that's back to nothing. And then I bring in the threshold and how much of it I want to either add, if it's something I want to add, in the case of siblings, how much I want to take away. And what's great about that, of course, is that it's dynamic. So it's going to grab some sibilants greater than others. The de-essers that, that we know about nowadays that are just literally a de are not sufficient. They really aren't. That's how I deal with it for the most part. Cool. Additional questions. You had a question right here. Yeah. Um, hi. My question would be, what exactly is your workflow typically for just vocals? Like, what exactly would you do when you have a vocal that's dry in front of you and how exactly do you turn that into a like a wall coat that's ready to be set in the mix since so again it's understanding you know what, what the song is um, an acoustic guitar simple song sing a songwriter song would make me want to go one direction if I was mixing Katy Perry I would go a different direction it would depend on what I'm working on uh, but generally um, I quickly get a balance up that makes to me that makes sense and I, and understand what the song is saying and then start to create the mood around the voice the most important thing always uh, in my opinion when I start is I try to actually fix things like I don't uh, this is another ar a point that we could argue about I don't necessarily like having an assistant that does everything I have assistants but I don't like them to do everything I want to do it because I want to discover I want to find things myself if it's fixed for me and handed to me then I'm not there's no discovery, if that makes sense. So part of that discovery process, part of what I would do is I'd pull up that voice and then I'd listen to it. Is it distorted? Is it sibilant? Is it too bright? Is it not bright enough? Does it feel like it's too dark? What does it need? Just to get it in the ballpark of what makes sense, right? And then um, I might, I will start setting it to some of the effects and see how it's feeling with the track and where it wants me to go. It's almost impossible to fully answer that to probably the likeness you like, because the truth of the matter is with creativity, you know, it's, it's, it's magic. It's like, you can't put it in a bottle and you, you have to just follow where the butterfly takes you, you know? Additional questions. Wow. All kinds of questions. I saw your hand up first. Yeah. How you doing? Um, going back to the, uh, reverb, the left mono and right yeah, reverb. Yeah. What I sometimes like to do is I use more than one reverb. I don't pan. I use, you know, like a small room maybe and then yep. a, a long, bright one. But I, I like what you were saying. But do you use the same reverb, left, mono, and right? Or do you use like a small room in the middle and then uh, maybe a different reverb, pan to the left, mono, and then a different? Or do you use the same one? So You understand? Yes, I do All understand. Right, thank you. Um, and in this session, there are multiple reverbs, quite a few, right? But for the... The left, center, right, I like them to be the same because for me, what they are is placing things uh, in a way that are, is separate but connected. So effectively, it's like, okay, I, I didn't record this. I wasn't a part of this, but I want to have an effect of what it was like in that room, essentially, where things were in that room. I want to create a visual. So you would send a mono to, to one, Absolutely. mono to the second? Yes. Okay, that's awesome. All right, yes. thank you. Somebody in the front row had one question. No? Okay. Jack, do you have time for a couple more? Yeah, I'm, I'm in no rush. Cool. Hi, Jack. Uh, my question to you is, uh, even at this stage, do you have like a reference track or are you ever referencing your mixes? Uh, so when I first started, uh, when I had three mentors and my first mentor always said to me, you have to be very careful when you're AV. And I didn't really realize until I was running my own sessions how much he was right. 
um, because it's it's very easy to chase the low end. You know, if you look at records like uh, Drake's records or, or The Weeknd's records, they're, they have like more low end than than in almost anyone. I mean, stupid amount of bottom end, right? Um, and they, and actually, they don't play well on certain systems because of that low end. So, what I normally do is 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 my brain is I let me say something. To do what we are doing here is a lifestyle. Everyone needs to understand that if you want to do this, this is a lifestyle. This becomes, and I say this in the Me Too world, but just understand, this becomes the other woman in your life. It's responsible for divorces. It's responsible for missing weddings. It's responsible for missing birthdays. It is the other woman in your life from a man's perspective, right? It is the other woman in your life. So because it's that way for me, uh, I'm always listening. So when it comes to references, lots of times if I'm, 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 no matter where I am, I'm always listening. If I hear something come on the radio or something in a restaurant, or whatever, I'm like, I like the way that sounds. Mealy Shazam, add it to my list of reference on the spot. As soon as I get back to the studio, I listen to it. Like, is it as good as I thought it was? What, what, what did I hear there that I thought was good there? And then that becomes a reference. So it could be a reference of how much mid-range that mix had where the voice was sitting or how bright something was or how the low wind was working. What can I learn from that? So you don't necessarily AB now, like you don't put it in a session and start AB. I used to. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what happens is you get to a place um, when you have so much time and experience doing it that you don't need that anymore. Right. In some ways, the references are a little bit of a training wheels, kind of, kind of, right. you know, right. I mean, that could come off as arrogant. I don't mean it that way whatsoever. No. No. But it'd be, it's better if you can get to a place where you finally find a pair of speakers that you really know well, and you have a room sounding well, and you just know. And you can feel it in your body like when it's right. That's the object. But it takes time to get there. And you got to screw up. And you still will screw up. Even after you think you've got it all nailed, you're still going to F up. Right. Thank you, Dad. Thank you. Let's get somebody from this side. Hey, Jack. Um, in terms of your vocal mix and how you balance in your sends, like the magic. And I think you had more of like kind of the beefier low end of the voice. How much processing are you doing on the like original uh, vocal track that is actually recorded on? And then how do you decide on how you balance the other sends? So in terms of that, um, it depends on, let me see if this is a, an example. Okay, it is not. So let's see here. So I kind of do kind of very similar thing I was just talking about with the F6. Um, I might listen to something like this and go like, oh, I'm hearing a lot of top end, not hearing as much low wind as I would like. And maybe, maybe something's not right in the mid range, kind of. So first thing I would do is I go, so when I hear that there, let's see, what is it? 177. When I hear that there, I hear, I hear, to put into words, I hear more mystery what she's saying. So you really hear it right on the no. So I would, I might have done something like that and go like, that's pretty cool. And I would, I'm down here, like I said. So I'm not stuck with, with EQ where I'm like, I like that, and then I add X amount of whatever the frequency is, and then I'm stuck. 
for the whole song. And I'm not with this, just it like, moves around where that hole is. Another reason why I like doing this and this kind of approach is I want you to listen when I play it without the dynamic EQ, right? It's kind of going to what I was talking about earlier, which is it's one in one plane. And now when I turn the EQ on, the dynamic EQ, you can see it moving like this, and so is she moving like that. All of a sudden she has a feel that she actually didn't really sing, didn't even have a If you listen to the every time. She's just sitting there, it's like not doing anything. Now listen. Yeah, that, that's the expert page of like going in and getting the attacks. And making it move and so you're so the processing on the vocal but the main vocal bus That's is to add vocal, like yeah. feel to the vocal as opposed to like where your magic bus is like for kind of coloration and to add it's for coloration and, and attitude right yeah and then after you're all done it's like okay is this thing locked you know is it like is it moving with the track or just sitting there you know got it because when she's singing it, lots of times, you know, because because this happens a lot with over compression. You know, people compress quite a bit, right? And yeah. then it just sits there and it doesn't have any attacks. Attacks don't move. So you can see what that's doing there. Is that clear to everybody? I mean, that alone, if you, if you leave with just that, uh, it's been worth your time. Literally. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. So we have time for one more question for Jack. Um, one thing I wanted to mention is on your way out, please leave your headsets and belt packs on your chair, if you would, please. Just strape them over the back. That'd be great. Last question. Hey, Jack. So my question is, uh, like, continuity throughout a record. Do you, do you, do you think about that consciously? Uh, are there things that you do to kind of keep the continuity between the songs? And... If you're mixing something that's, say, recorded in a bunch of different studios, how do you deal with that? So I think that that is something that doesn't maybe matter nearly as much as it used to. I think that when, when we had people had the patience to sit down and listen to an entire record, right, or even a compact disc, um, that might have mattered. I think now it's a collection of songs, you know. The mixtape really kind of pushed it in that direction. Um, and, and then additionally, I think it'd also be fair to say that I would, I, you know, if you think about, let's go to the forefathers, the Beatles, right? Those songs did not sound the same. One of the things that we really liked is we'd put the song on and, uh, you know, Octopus Garden would come on and sounded one way and then another song would come on and sound another way. And you're just like, it was all about that song and that feeling to get that across you. I think that that's a much better way to go than to be concerned about not that you're saying this, but as an example for everybody, you know, the exact same drum sound, the exact same bass sound, the voice is always this. It's like, I don't think that works that way because I don't think the songs are that way. You know, I think the forefathers had it right. Oh, oh hello. Hi. And, and of course, I have to ask the final question, which is, where, are you, where do you stand with breaths? Like, if you listen to a Demi Lovato record, the breaths are as loud or louder than the vocal. And I guess that's, that's percussion. That's opportunism. The best but thing about breaths is clip gain. Thank God for clip gain. Clip gain is so awesome. 
because now you can determine how much of that breath is in there easily. You know, you can go in and like, okay, I want this breath to be a little quieter, but louder. You know, it depends what it is. Of course, if there's a, the band stops and it's silent, you might not want a breath into it. You might want the surprise, or you might want the emotion of, right? So it's just all art again. It's deciding what you want. And did you do that kind of shaping in this song? Um, in this song, yes, on the stem that go on the voice, this is the stem. I did, I do that. Sometimes I'll do stems prior to mixing too. I process them. If something is comes to me that's like really like just dead, I might do some of that kind of processing prior, uh, so that when I pull the faders up, it, it gives me something right away. Uh, that's why I think a stereo bus is important. The last thing I'll say is that whatever you're using for your stereo bus, I I've spent. I can't show it here, obviously, because I don't have all my gear with me, but I have serious, popped up stereo bus. I've spent a lot of time figuring it out so that when I pull things up, it just right away sounds really good and it feeds me, makes me excited. Uh, I think that's very, very important. Cool. Last word. Ladies and gentlemen, master class in vocals, in mono, no less. <laughs> Amazing. Mr. Jack Joseph Puig, let's hear it for him. Thank you